Thank you so much, Carla, for putting that on last second. Unfortunately, we didn't know if there was going to be a special music today or not, but God had a special music in mind, and that was a, definitely a blessing for me, and hopefully it was a blessing for you as well. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Carney. I am the assistant pastor here at the Stanford Gap Church. Our senior pastor, uh, Mickey Mallory, is away this week. He uh, went to Florida with his wife. As I've been telling people this week, somebody's got to go to Florida. I guess it's not me. I get to stay and hold down the fort. So um, we're just praying that Mickey has a safe trip back. He's coming home tomorrow, and we'll be happy when he is back. But we're thankful today for all those who are here, the guests, the members. If you've been here before, welcome. And if this is your first time, we welcome you here today. Now, there is a special person here today that I have to point out, and I'm not going to let him leave before I point him out. My dad is here today, and is he, he's in the back left corner. So before you, before you leave, he's wearing an orange shirt, gray suit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mark him up here. Before you leave, uh, uh, say hi to him. He came uh, on Greyhound, almost a 24-hour trip. He said he's never doing that again. So he thought it would be a, a less on the body if he uh, rode Greyhound, but he found out that it's probably worse on the body for you because you're sitting in a bus and with a lot of people who probably don't want to sleep either, or at least try to sleep, but there's always that one person on the bus. This morning, we have a special person speaking. He's spoken here before. In fact, he's been here for much longer than I have. I've only been here for seven months, and I remember meeting Andrew Osborne my first day here. He probably doesn't remember that, but I remember, <laughs> I remember he was a very smart kid. And he's grown up into a very amazing, godly young man. And I'm sure you guys have seen that more than I have. So today we just want to welcome Andrew, one of our youth, uh, to speak for us today and speak with what God has to say to him. Oh, thank you, Pastor Ian. You make me feel so special. I like having introductions. <laughs> well, now there's a thing I like to do before I start speaking normally, and that thing is called prayer. So let's all go ahead and bow our heads for an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day and for everything that you've given us in life. We want to thank you that we could all be here today, Lord, at church, to learn more about you and hopefully grow closer to you each and every single day. We want to pray that... Um, Please be with me as I speak. Let the words that I speak not be mine, but yours. And want to help that everyone can go away, hopefully to gain something from it today. Also, please help us all to be in heaven. Show us how to get there and help us all to have a wonderful day. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so now I want to be real with you folks. I have not prepared well for this sermon. See, I was told I'd be preaching in March, but I had no idea what the exact date would be. I was told I'd be preaching in March, and I just kind of hoped that maybe I'd be preaching on the fourth Sabbath, or even the fifth, if there even is a fifth Sabbath this month. But as it turns out, I'm preaching on the second Sabbath. Oh well. But I knew this day would be coming when I would be up here speaking to you all, but I just didn't know when, so I didn't prepare. I really haven't been praying that much about it. I haven't been studying my Bible. I, I have my sermon notes, my little cheat sheet, but it always helps to practice it. And our Adventist doctrines, you know, I've basically forgotten those in the process for preparing for this sermon. Yes, I am quite utterly unprepared. In fact, well, now that's not the best way to start a sermon, is it? Let's try a different approach. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7 says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Getting straight down to the point, some of us may have to stand trial for our faith someday, and possibly very soon. And when that happens, we need to know why we believe what we believe. We're going to be tested to prove our faith. And now, just two very short minutes ago, I just claimed I didn't prepare. Don't worry, that's a total example. I'm semi-convinced I'm prepared. But that's an example because looking at what I said, not having prayed or studied my Bible or any of that, is not that going to be the case with a lot of people in the time of trouble when they're standing trial for their faith. We need to be prepared to understand and explain these things so that should the time come, whether it be in the time of trouble or even in today's time, we can explain to others that what we believe is the truth. We need to be prepared to preach or talk about from the Bible alone that what we believe is true. And when I talk about our beliefs, I'm talking about our Adventist beliefs. For example, as Adventists, we believe that the Sabbath is on Saturday rather than Sunday. As Adventists, we believe that when you die, you do not go straight to heaven or hell, but instead you sleep in the grave until the Lord comes back. And also, as Adventists, we believe that after we spend 1,000 years in heaven, we come back down to the new earth and the new Jerusalem, and the Lord, Lord rains down fire upon the wicked, we believe they will not burn for all eternity, as so many other believe. And these are the kind of things that we need to be able to prove and explain to others. And I really only have time to preach about one of these things today, unless we want to be here for a few days. But I thought to myself, what better topic to talk about than hellfire? <laughs> so that's our topic for today. How long do the wicked burn? And I believe, I, I truly believe this is a very important topic to understand. Because first of all, it is one of the most misunderstood topics in the entire world. We believe that the wicked don't burn forever, but most everyone else, or most other religions, they believe that they're going to burn in eternal, fiery, agonizing torment and suffer and terrible, terrible things. But that's not biblical. God is the God of love. 1 John 4 verse 8 says that God is love. And this is also an important topic because it has led so many people astray, away from the church. Because they read that and they think to themselves, how could a God so loving and so caring sentence people to an eternal torment. And so they just leave the church altogether because they don't understand how that's possible. And so now before I get too deep into the topic, I want to explain how people come to misunderstand things like this. A lot of people will read one single verse, one sentence in the Bible, and then they build an entire belief out of it. They'll read that verse without looking at the context or the meanings, finding out what it's truly saying. They'll read that one verse and say, well, obviously since this one single verse out of all 31,102 total verses in the Bible says this, it must obviously mean this. That is wrong. But that's what people do. Because what if someone came to you today and said, well, obviously the wicked do burn forever. Just look at Revelation 20, verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And just look at Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, are going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now we know that that's actually not true. The wicked do not burn forever. So how do we prove that? And that's what I want to look at today. Looking at verses, we're going to see what the Bible truly says about that topic. And now I'm about to start jumping all around the Bible. Just a warning, we're going to be looking at verses in Matthew and Mark, Romans, the Chronicles, Jeremiah, Malachi. 
If you want to remember these verses, get your pens and papers out. We're going on a journey. So let's begin. I think one of the first steps to understanding a topic like this is to look at the enemy's proof, or in this case, verses that seem to support an eternal torment point of view. And I already made note of two of those verses, Revelation 20, verse 10, and Jude, verse 7, but there's a few more I want to look at, starting with the book, or a verse in the good old book of Matthew. Matthew 25, verse 46, if you want to turn there, you can. And as whoever turns there wants to, I want to immediately point out that Jesus is speaking the words in this verse. Jesus himself is speaking the words in Matthew 25, verse 46. And this verse reads, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. I should also point out that Jesus himself is talking about the wicked going into everlasting punishment and not the righteous because they have life eternal. But isn't that interesting? According to this verse, Jesus himself seems to support an eternal torment. So on to the next verse. Let's read Mark 9, verse 43. This is another verse that many, many people will use to try and prove an eternal fiery doom. This verse also holds the words of Jesus, and it says, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So now we have an everlasting fire and an unquenchable fire. Great. Wonderful. And all these words are spoken by Jesus. Now, there's one more verse I want to look at that seems to support eternal torment. This one is found in the book of Revelation, it's in chapter 14, verse 11. And now, there's a very special thing about this verse. It's an important little detail. I'll see if you can figure it out, but I'll tell you what it is afterwards. Revelation 14, verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So did you notice that little detail, that little special key to that verse? It's part of the third angel's message. The message that we as Adventists are supposed to be spreading everywhere seems to support an eternal torment at first glance. So now all these verses, they seem to support that. It's what they look like at first. But the problem so many people make when reading the Bible is they only read the surface. They only read the surface of the Bible. They're not reading the context. They're looking at the ancient meanings of the Bible. And so the next step is to look at the context of these verses. And in this case, I'm going to say the context is probably the entire Bible. So now that we're done for now looking at verses that support eternal torment, let's look at verses that support what Adventists believe. A simple, eternal death for the wicked. Our first destination is Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And this verse, the time frame of it is after the thousand years in heaven, when we're coming, the righteous, when they come back down to the new earth, the Lord rains down fire and devours the wicked. That's the time frame of this verse. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, starting in verse 1, it says, For behold... The day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. For the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow as calves of the stall. Verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be the ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. The two biggest things to notice in this verse is that, one, it says the wicked shall be burned up, and B, they will be the ashes under the righteous feet. Both those kind of imply that the wicked will be dead and not burning forever. Because, use some common sense, look at, your own, look at your own language. When something is being described as burned up, 
usually about, you know, like 100% of the time, it means they're gone and no more. It's finished. And also, ashes cannot burn. Scientifically speaking, ashes all by themselves cannot burn. And I know that. I googled it. <laughs> so in other words, I'm not sure at all, but we're going to say ashes can't burn. But according to this verse alone, when the righteous are in the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the wicked will be the burned up ashes under their feet. They will not be burning for all eternity. So let's move on. The next verse that supports what Adventists teach is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verse 20. Psalms 37, verse 20 says, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the lambs. They shall consume into the smoke, shall they consume away. And in case you read that verse and wonder what in the world does consume mean, the Hebrew word for consume in this context is kala, which means to perish, to cease, to end, be finished. Psalms, verse, Psalms 37 verse 20 seems to say it as clear as day. The wicked will perish, and into the smoke they will perish away. The fire will burn them up. The next verse on our list of verses to read is a very well-known verse. It's Romans 6, verse 23. And I'm pretty sure most of us could recite that verse off the top of our heads. It says, for the wages of sin is death. It doesn't say the wages of sin is eternal suffering and fiery, agonizing torment, but rather death. And now I like to be positive. I like to be sure about these things. So I went ahead and looked up the Greek word for death. And in this context, the Greek word is thanatos, which sure enough means death. Death means death, in case you're wondering. It doesn't mean eternal torment, but it means death. So the next verse that I want to look at is probably the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. John 3, verse 16. Good old John 3, 16 supports what Adventists teach. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not suffer eternal torment and fiery agonizing pain, but have eternal life. That's not what it says, is it? No, no. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And now I like to be sure about these things. I like to be positive. So I looked up the Greek word for perish in this context. And though my pronunciation may be 120% off, the Greek word for perish is apolumai or upalomi. And that means to destroy fully, completely, utterly destroy. Whosoever believeth in God will not be fully destroyed, but have eternal life. God will destroy sin once and for all, and it will be no more, never to rise again. So all these verses, and quite a bit more, they support what Adventists teach. So case closed, right? We can have closing prayer now, and then you can be dismissed. We're all good. But that's incorrect. Because we just saw earlier that a bunch of other verses do support an eternal torment and fiery, agonizing pain. So what does that mean? Is the Bible contradicting itself? Are some verses correct and the others are just plain, straight up wrong? Which side is correct? Which side is telling the truth? Which side do we believe? I mean, sure, we have plenty of verses that support what we have in this belief, but that isn't always enough. We now need to go back and look at what those other verses are really saying. What do they mean when they say the wicked shall burn for all eternity? The answers we seek all lie within what words like forever or unquenchable mean in the Bible. Because remember, the Bible was originally written in the Greek and Hebrew languages, or something like that. Our modern day meanings and translations are a lot different than the ancient meanings and translations. They can mean totally different things. So when it says they burn forever, it doesn't necessarily mean that. 
So now I want to go back and look at the verses we looked at earlier, the ones that seem to support eternal torment. And we're going to look at those verses, and we're going to look at some other verses too to decipher, try and figure out what they're really meaning. And I want to start by looking at Jude verse 7. Jude verse 7 is the verse that said the, that cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are going to suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. So now let me ask you a question. Are the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? Can you go to the place where Sodom and Gomorrah once stood and still find it burning? I mean, God did destroy the city with fireballs of death, but I'm fairly certain it's not still burning today. And one could argue that maybe the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah are burning. But notice it says they're suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, not the eternal fire itself. So I went and looked up vengeance on dictionary.com because that's totally trustworthy. I don't know if it is or not. I'm starting to question the reliability of dictionary.com. But according to that, the very first three words for the definition of vengeance is infliction of injury. So now I ask you another question. What injury would being engulfed in flames the size of a small planet inflict? Death, most likely. When Jude verse 7 says Sodom and Gomorrah are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, it doesn't actually mean they're burning for all eternity. It's talking about something else. And looking at some next verses, it will help us understand that better. So let's head back to Matthew 25, verse 46 now. In Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus say, The wicked go away into everlasting punishment. Now, I said earlier that it's helpful to look at the Greek and Hebrew meanings, the ancient languages of the Bible. But sometimes it also helps to just understand your own language. People are misunderstanding this first because of the English language. And I don't blame them. English is a very difficult language to understand. It's a stupid language, but it just helps if you understand it. Because look at what the verse says. It says the wicked will go away into everlasting punishment, not punishing. There is a difference. What is the punishment for sin? The wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23 says so. So when Jesus says the wicked go away into everlasting punishment, he's talking about the actual punishment, which is death, not eternal torment. And now I was talking with a good friend of mine not too long ago, maybe last Friday, a week from yesterday, and he asked me, well, does that mean that they're going to die over and over again and just keep eternally dying? There's a quote I'm going to read later that talks about that. But very briefly, the quote basically says the Greek word for everlasting in this context, aenios, when it's using verbs of action or some grammatical thing I don't understand, it's talking about the result and not the actual process. So in this case, when he's talking about everlasting punishment, he's talking about the result, which is death, and not the process, which is the fire. And there's another verse that helps to clear this up. It's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. In it, Paul says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When Jesus uses the phrase everlasting punishment, he is talking about the result. He's going to destroy sin once and for all, never for it to last, never for it to rise again. So now let's move on. Let's head back to the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 43. My, I'm going to read that verse again, but I'm also going to read Mark, chapter 9, verse 44, because it helps in understanding this a lot better. Mark 9, verse 43 said, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell 
and to the fire that never shall be quenched. And then verse 44 says, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. In other words, wherever this fire that can't be quenched is, the worm does not die either. So now let me give you a little bit of biblical history. Probably the only type of history I enjoy talking about is biblical history. But back in the days of Jesus' time, when he walked this earth, there were two main ways in which the dead could be buried. There was the common, ordinary, simple grave for those who had money. And then for those who didn't have money, their dead body was cast into Gehenna, the city dump outside of Jerusalem walls. And the thing about Gehenna, this city dump, is that it was always burning or smoldering. There was never a time when Gehenna was not burning. And it was always burning so that all the city waste, live animals, and apparently dead criminals that were cast in there would be completely, utterly destroyed. And now listen to this next part carefully. Whatever the fire didn't completely, utterly destroy in Gehenna, the maggots and the worms would. Remember how the verse says, where the worm dieth not, and the fire shall not be quenched? We can't be 100% sure, but it's a popular belief among some that Jesus was using Gehenna as an example for what happens to the wicked, complete, utter destruction. But now, in case that doesn't satisfy you, in case you're not satisfied with the answer, there's more to this verse. Notice how it says that the fire is unquenchable. Nowhere in that verse does it say that the wicked are actually burning forever. It just says the fire is not quenched. There's another verse that talks about an unquenchable fire. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27. It says, but if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering in the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. These words were then fulfilled in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 36, verse 19. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem. And they burnt all the palaces there with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. Jeremiah talks about an unquenchable fire, but it also says it devoured the palaces of Jerusalem. Even if a fire is unquenchable, that doesn't mean things will burn in it for all eternity. Just if the wicked were to burn an unquenchable fire, it doesn't mean they'll actually suffer in it forever. And there's another verse in Isaiah that talks about this. Even if it's an unquenchable fire, that doesn't even mean the fire lasts forever. Isaiah 34, verse 9 through 11, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just the basis of it. Isaiah 34, verse 9 through 11 says, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone. And the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. And now skipping ahead a little bit, it says, But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. In other words, this unquenchable fire had to have gone out at some point in time because now there are living, breathing birds living there. If we look at the ancient meanings and translations in the Bible, we find that when the Bible uses terms like the fire can't be quenched or an unquenchable fire, it's not talking about the fire itself, but rather the work being done by the fire. In other words, the fire is unquenchable while it's burning its object. Nothing can stop it from doing its job. When the wicked are burning in hellfire, they won't burn for all eternity, and the fire will be unquenchable. But that doesn't mean forever. It means it will keep burning them until they die from it. Nothing can stop the fire from burning them up and turning them into ashes. But once it's done, once it's finished its job, the fire will die out and be gone and sin with it. Sin will no longer rise again. 
So when Jesus talks about that unquenchable fire in the book of Mark, he's not actually talking about the wicked burning forever. First of all, he could be using Gehenna as an example. But he's also just talking about the work being done. Once the wicked are burned up and destroyed forever, that's it. That's done. They're no more. Now there's another verse I want to go back to. That one was in Revelation 14, verse 10 through 11. Now that we're finally done talking about Mark, we'll go to Revelation 14. This is the verse that talked about, or this is the verse in the third angel's message. The message that we're supposed to be spreading that seemed to support eternal torment. But I want to read it again, and I'm going to add in verse 10. It says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So now the interesting thing about this verse is that it's not talking about our topic at all. It's a completely different time frame, actually. I'm talking about when we come back down, when the righteous come to the new earth, and then the wicked burn then. This verse isn't talking about that at all. It's a completely different time frame. Because you notice how it says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out. So what is the wrath of God? Revelation 15, verse 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Revelation 14, verse 11, actually takes place during the seven last plagues, before even the second coming happens. The second coming happens, then we go up to heaven, we spend a thousand years in heaven, and then the righteous come down, and then the wicked are burned and destroyed. But Revelation 14, verse 11, takes place before even the second coming. And look at Revelation 16, verse 8 through 9. It says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. Remember, it says the wrath of God is poured out. The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Also, it's only the wicked that burn from, this, from these plagues. The righteous are not affected by the seven last plagues, but only the wicked. And Revelation 14, verse 11, seems to make that clear as well. It's not talking about our time frame at all. It's talking about a completely different time. And also it says, the smoke of their torment ascends forever, not their actual torture. And even in that case, forever may seem like forever. So I want to go back to one more verse, Revelation 20, verse 10. This is the one that described the devil and the beast and the false prophet burning in fire and brimstone forever. And this verse seems as clear as it can be. There's no unquenchable fire rather than an actual forever fire. It's not talking about a punishment rather than punishing. It is indeed talking about the correct time. So what is it saying when the wicked burn forever? Depending on the context, forever can have many, many different meanings in the Bible. For example, have you ever heard someone say, I waited forever for my vacation to arrive? Or maybe they said, I waited forever at the mall for my friends. They don't actually mean forever. Waiting at the mall for your friends can be as little as 10 minutes or something. But it doesn't actually, it's, it's a hyperbole, it's an exaggeration. And an example of this is found in the book of Jonah. Jonah 2 verse 6 says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. What seemed like forever to Jonah was really only three short days and nights spent in the belly of a whale fish thingy thing. Forever can also mean in a person's entire life in the Bible. 
In other words, if you say you did something forever, it means your entire life. 1 Samuel 1 verse 22 says, But Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. But then just six short verses later, verse 28 says, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he should serve. Forever in this context means a person's eternal life. Samuel's dead now. The Bible tells us so. He's not still serving the Lord to this day. Verse 22 may say he would serve forever, but verse 28 says as long as he lives. In this context, we can find that forever just means a person's entire life. So in Revelation 20, verse 10, when it says they'll burn for all eternity or forever, it doesn't mean forever. It means the wicked will burn until the fire destroys them, until they die. The fire will burn for as long as it takes to destroy them, and then the fire will disappear, and the punishment of the wicked, which is death, will be everlasting. They'll be the ashes under the righteous feet. Revelation 20, verse 9 also, the verse right before Revelation 20, verse 10, it says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It says it right there. They were devoured. It doesn't say it burned them forever, but devoured. And also, the Greek word for forever in this context is aion. It's actually where we get our word eon from. But the Greek word for forever, aion, can mean a period of time, an interval, an age, or a season. In other words, when it says forever, it means just a period of time, not actually for all eternity. Nowhere in the Bible does it actually say the wicked will burn forever. People are simply misunderstanding what it's saying. And before I close, I want to read you that quote I talked about earlier. I found it on the internet, so I can trust it. But it's actually from a book. And the guy who quoted it is some guy named Dr. Basil Atkinson. And the title of his book is Life and Immortality, an Examination of the Nature and Meaning of Life and Death as They Are Revealed in the Scriptures. The quote basically sums up what I've been talking about, and it goes as follows. When the adjective aenios, meaning everlasting, is used in Greek with nouns of action, it has reference to the result of the act not the process. The phrase everlasting punishment is comparable to everlasting redemption and everlasting salvation, both scriptural phrases. No one supposes that we are being redeemed or saved forever. We were redeemed and saved once for all by Christ with eternal results. In the same way, the lost will not be passing through the process of punishment forever but will be punished once and for all with eternal results. So you can see how easy it is for people to misunderstand what's in the Bible. It's misconceptions like these that have led to so many different beliefs around the world. It's misconceptions like these that have led so many people astray from the church. And it's misconceptions like these that we have to be able to understand so that when the time should come, whether it be in today's time or in the time of trouble, we'll be ready to help others go down the path of Christ. And now I've, I've just barely scratched the surface today. There are so many other topics and beliefs and doctrines to talk about, such as the truth of the Sabbath or what happens after you die. But these are the things we should be studying. And it's no easy task. You know, it's, I don't expect you to know all these things next week. I'm still learning them myself, and I've been studying them for like three years or so now. I don't know every single little detail. But it's things like that that I want to know. I want to understand. So that when the time comes, when I'm being tested for my faith, should it ever happen, I'll be ready to give glory to God and prove my faith in doing so. I want to be prepared to do that. And most importantly, I want to be prepared to meet God face to face. And if knowing the truth, such as how long the wicked burn, helps me get there, and if it helps me prepare others to get there, then I want to know the truth. I am burning to know the truth, in case you're wondering where my sermon title's coming from. 
But don't be like me. Don't be like fake pretend me at the beginning of the sermon. You don't want to be completely, utterly, 120% unprepared for any situation in which you have the opportunity to help lead someone to Christ. Know what you believe and why you believe it. I want to be prepared to see Jesus, and I think everyone here wants to be. We all want to be to heaven. We all want to go there. Let's all be prepared to prove our faith, and let's be prepared to help others prepare to meet Jesus as well on that glorious day of his return. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day once again. And Lord, life is pretty simple-ish right now in today's time, but it may not always be that way. There will be times when we will go through grievous trials, and there will be times when we have an opportunity to give glory to you and show your teachings. The Bible says you are love, and you would never sentence anyone to eternal torment. We want to be prepared, Lord, to give glory to you and show what you're truly trying to say to everyone, truly trying to teach. We want to pray that you help and give us wisdom and understanding to understand these things so that we can come closer to you every day and better understand you. We want to pray as we all go our separate ways today, please keep us safe, give us all safe rides home, and just, Lord, please help us to grow closer to you each and every single day. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. 
Loving Lord, as we come to the end of this service, may we continue to put our trust in you, knowing that your plans for us are permanent. Give us the faith to hold on to those plans. And day by day, may we continue to trust you where we can't trace you, knowing that we will be with you if we remain faithful to you. Take us now from this sanctuary and be with us until we meet again, is our prayer in Jesus' name.